Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Middle East Matters on France 24. Here's what's coming up in the show. Lebanon and Israel agree their maritime border. The historic deal paves the way for both countries to explore natural gas reserves in the Mediterranean. As the crackdown on protesters continues in Iran, we talk to one of the country's foremost feminist thinkers to hear why women are calling for revolution now. And we check out a new exhibition here in Paris telling the stories of LGBT artists through their own eyes. But first, they are two countries technically at war. Yet this week, Lebanon and Israel reached an historic agreement to settle their maritime border. The deal has been years in the making and could unlock significant offshore gas production for both countries, as Antonia Kerrigan now reports. Israel and Lebanon have reached a historic agreement on their maritime borders. A hydrocarbons dispute over 860 square metres of sea in the eastern Mediterranean, home to two coveted gas fields. Both parties have welcomed the US brokered deal. Israeli Premier Lai Lapid hailing it as a breakthrough. A historic achievement that will strengthen Israel's security, inject billions into Israel's economy, and ensure the stability of our northern border. The Lebanese government insisting it has not compromised its negotiating position. Lebanon has obtained its full rights, and all of its remarks have been taken into account. Despite rumors that Lebanon did not receive any of its demands, Lebanon has obtained all of them because they are rightful demands. Having previously threatened to block the deal, even Hezbollah, a sworn enemy of Israel, has also given the green light. The area has been under negotiation since 2020, with both countries making competing claims to the hydrocarbon-rich Karish gas field and the thus far unexplored Kana site. The details of the agreement are yet to be made public, but it is understood that Karish will belong to Israel and Lebanon will control the exploration of the Kana field, where a consortium led by French energy giant Total Energies will run exploration and exploitation, paying some royalties to Israel on any future profits. Since the 2006 Lebanon war ended in a ceasefire, the two countries have remained officially at war. Since 2019, Lebanon has been in the thick of its worst ever liquidity crisis, drastically limiting access to fuel. If the Kana gas field proves rich, this could be an economic lifeline for the country. Next to Iran, where the protest movement is now approaching one month. Led by women, the demonstrators are demanding sweeping political and social change. The authorities have used force in a bid to quash the unrest. Over 150 people are reported to have been killed and thousands more arrested. In fact, this week the government announced it had freed some 1,700 people without giving a figure for the number still detained. Well, joining me now to discuss this moment in Iran is Suzanne Tamasabe. She's one of Iran's foremost feminist figures who runs the organization Femina. Thank you for speaking to us on France 24 today. It's a pleasure to have you. Um, first of all, women in Iran, as you know all too well, have been fighting for their rights for decades. So what is it that makes these protests, led by a new generation of young people, different? Well... Um, these protests are different and they're unique in the sense that they're national protests with the involvement of men and women. And um, they're initially, at least, they were centered around a demand for women's rights and for the accountability of the wrongful death in custody of Mahsa Amini, a Kurdish Iranian woman. Um, they're also unique because they're national, they're, they don't have a particular leadership, their leadership is very dispersed, the protests are also very dis dispersed, the protests are very dispersed, and um, there are a lot of young people involved in these protests, including teenagers, as we see some teenagers have also been killed. Um, you know, the protest is intersectional. Um, that it has the involvement of of different groups of people, different ethnic groups, but people of different ages and different geographies and different social backgrounds across the country. So it's the middle class, but also the working class. And they're asking for serious political change. Many of them are asking for regime change. So it's not they're not just asking for change in women's rights anymore, but they're asking for broad political change, change in the system. And they are largely young people, aren't they? 
I think that there are a lot of young people involved in these protests. And we see, I mean, it's unprecedented to see, you know, 15, 16 year olds in protests that are getting killed or getting arrested. So teenagers, high schoolers, we've never seen this. This is this is the first. The women, the, you know, of course, the student movement, you know, with young group of of of, of people, citizens, you know, has always been involved in political change and political protest movements. But now we're seeing high schoolers and maybe even junior, you know, middle schoolers involved in this. And so this, in that sense, is un unprecedented. This involvement of a younger generation that was born not after the revolution, but long after the revolution, uh, was born to the children who were born after the revolution. And let's talk about what the response of the security forces has been. There's been a really rather aggressive crackdown. I mentioned that figure, 150 people killed. It may well be a far higher toll. But nonetheless, people are still turning out in the streets. So what options do the authorities now have if they truly want to quash this? Or do you think this protest movement simply won't go away? Well, I, I, ha I have to point here that the violence has been severe and it's been especially severe in the ethnic minority areas of Kurdistan, where the protests started, where Gina was from, and the protests have been, you know, consistently have continued. And also in Sistan, Baluchistan, where a group of, you know, people attending Friday prayer were gone down, 91 people to, to the last, that was the last figure that I saw. So, you know, it was shocking and brutal. And, in both, you know, in Kurdistan, the si several cities in Kurdistan have turned into virtual war zones in the last few days. So I, I think it's important to take note of that. Um, although this protest is not a sectarian protest, it really is all Iranians reclaiming their lives and reclaiming their freedoms. But unfortunately, the state has, is trying, I think, to make it into a sectarian uh, protest and a sectarian way of quashing it. It's very, it's very difficult to assess how many people have been arrested. Usually in the past, people would be arrested and released quickly. The state, the um, authorities are taking their time in terms of releasing uh, prisoners. So the prison conditions are terrible. They're overcrowded. There's no ventilation. A lot of people are, what we're hearing is that a lot of people are coming to these prisons already um, injured, needing medical care. But, you know, the prison conditions are not standard by any means. And um, there's a lot of violence also at the time of arrest and also in prisons from what we're hearing. And I should say that pretty much every uh, activist, every political activist, every, every social activist, every women's rights activist, feminist activist, they've all been arrested. We're collecting um, uh, profiles on the women human rights defenders and feminists who've been arrested. And we have, you know, over or over 50 or more that we've been able to verify. We know it's a lot more than that. And this is significant because already we had 50 some uh, women human rights defenders serving long prison sentences. So this will, you know, this is having a serious impact on the women's movement as well. Suzanne Tamasabe, unfortunately we'll have to leave it there, but I want to thank you very much indeed for coming to talk to us today here on France 24. Thank you very much. In other news, Palestinian police have arrested a suspect in the killing of a 25-year-old man after his body was found decapitated in the West Bank. LGBT groups say Ahmed Abu Mahahe received death threats because he was gay. He'd been living in Israel while his asylum application for Canada was being assessed. Well, a new exhibition here in Paris is shining a light on the immense challenges facing the LGBT community in the Middle East. It's called Habibi, and it explores the issues through the eyes of gay artists from Algeria to Lebanon. France 24's Nisreen Benzabouche has been to check it out. Institute in Paris has made a bold decision with its latest exhibition, highlighting queer artists in the gay community. Entitled Habibi Mon Amour, the show is garnering praise. It's very interesting that the Arab World Institute is doing an exhibition on the LGBTQ artists because they're never highlighted, and it's really unfortunate. They are artists who deserve to be known, and I'm very proud they've got a show. The exhibition shows the topics explored by these artists, the intimate, the everyday, the relationship with the body, how they engage in daily life. 
This in a world where the presence of LGBT is not always accepted and is even punishable by death in some countries, such as Iran and Saudi Arabia. Our project looks at their artistic creations and goes beyond the question of whether this community exists or not, but asks the question of how they see the world and how they position themselves in society and what response they can give to society in general. Ali Reza Shojayan is an Iranian artist. The male body is at the center of his work. His paintings depict men in moments of pleasure and weakness an image that is contrary to most representations of men in the Arab world. I think that if we manage to always have the hope of obtaining our freedom, of having control over our bodies, that will inspire the whole region, not just Iranian women. In the Middle East, more and more young people want the freedom to explore their sexual orientation, a message that resonates around the world. Well, we end the program with some music. It's by the Lebanese band Mashra Leila. Now, the group have announced they are disbanding following abuse online. Their lead singer, Hamid Sino, is gay. Now here they are performing one of their most famous songs. In English it's called Smell the Jasmine and it is about a gay relationship. Take a listen and thank you for watching this week's show. We'll be back at the same time next week.